Hello, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. And you could also find me on the Conscious Resistance Network and Conscious Resistance YouTube channel. So today we have uh, Connor Boyag, who's a author, um, a libertarian slash voluntarist author of uh, various books, Feardom and the two Tuttle Twins books so far. I'm, I assume there's going to be many more to follow. <laughs> um, so uh, we'll get right into it. So Connor, so why don't you, uh, we'll start off with, um, uh, tell us how you uh, became a voluntarist. Oh, good question. Um, you know, like a lot of people, my uh, transition started in conservatism. I was raised that way. Um, didn't really know anything about anything. And it was actually after college I started reading a lot. Um, I was exposed to uh, Ron Paul initially in a documentary called America, Freedom to Fascism. And so that was my first experience. Uh, it was about 2006, I think, uh, learning about Ron Paul. And I was very impressed with what he said. So I went and I started reading a lot of his stuff. I became kind of a constitutionalist for a while. Uh, slowly started to see the deficiencies in that philosophy. And so I became more libertarian. Um, and of course, they say that you know it takes the average libertarian like what thirty days to become an anarchist, basically to to kind of see the the logical conclusion of everything. And so um, it, it's consistent uh, voluntarism with you know my faith and my um, outlook on life and logic. And so it, it was a quick transition in the end. Um, once I really tried to to study the issues, I really like diving deep into stuff and and discussing and debating and looking at uh, exposing, rooting out logical fallacies. And so I spend a lot of my time thinking. And uh, and so when I really tried to rigorously analyze all the hot topics of the day, it it quickly became uh, the the logical conclusion of, of what should be done: voluntarism. And so um, uh, I, I'm kind of a sneaky voluntarist. I don't really wear it on my sleeve. I outwardly portray myself as a libertarian, and I, I think it's that even that term has a lot of stigma. And so I work to my my uh, you know my role. I, I think is to try and help people understand libertarianism and, and dispel some of the myths and help them understand the overall philosophy, get them in the door for libertarianism, which I do through a variety of means. And, and in the end, you know, they'll find their own way to voluntarism you know, in that next 30 days uh, pretty easily. But, but my work is trying to get people of different perspectives, mainly conservatism because of my background and, and where I live and uh, the, the circles that I run. And I try and get conservatives to understand libertarianism and then kind of push them down that path a little more. Nice. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I saw that documentary too, Freedom to Fascism. That, that's the Aaron Russo documentary you're, you're referring to. It is. To. Yeah. yeah, the late Aaron Russo. Yeah, because I um, I saw that uh, a while ago and, yeah, it really affected me as well. And then uh, I also realized that uh, I think some of the IRS people that were, um, that, that spoke in that, in the film, did, didn't something happen to them afterwards? Like, I know Aaron Russo died later, but I think some of the, the IRS people who spoke out, they somehow got tracked down or, or something happened to them. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, I wasn't aware. Yeah. Yeah, like I think his name is Bruce Bannister and then the yeah, a couple and a couple of the women that that were talking and speaking out. So huh. you know, I guess when you do a, a you know, a um um a documentary that, you know, portrays the message to the world, you know, sometimes you get some backlash from the uh the people who are trying to defend the status quo, right? Aggressively. Maybe, maybe I should end this video chat right now so that I don't. <laughs> it's too dangerous. <laughs> don't implicate myself in anything. Well, if I'm not already on ten government databases, <laughs> nothing else will, you know, change that. So. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. You know, it's like if we, I think that's, I think it's called the chilling effect, where, um, you know, where the the government. Uh, surveils the population, you know, through the email or through phone call or through whatever, and then and then as a result of that surveillance, people's behavior changes, right? Because they know they're being yeah. watched, right? Absolutely. And it's a very unfortunate situation because then then it's like you've already surrendered, you've already you know abdicated your freedom, you know, when when you start to do that. So. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> but um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your uh, the books, the the Total Twins. Sure. So I, uh, I'm a homeschooling father of two young children, 
And about two years ago, I was trying to look around for material that I could expose my children to on on these key, you know, liberty concepts. Um, and so I was searching on Amazon and was just flabbergasted with how there was literally nothing. I mean, there was some stuff on like the Constitution for kids or American history for kids, but you know, liberty and economics and property rights and these kind of core underlying concepts to the whole thing, to the Constitution, American history, uh, there was nothing. And so, you know, I'm an enterprising guy. And so I said, there should be something. And so uh, a buddy of mine, um, Elijah Stanfield, he's a, a animator, illustrator, overall, very creative guy. And uh, he had previously said, hey, you know, if the opportunity ever arose, we should work on something. And so we talked about this idea. Um, and, and he was totally on board. He's also a, a dad of, uh, I think, now six children. And and so we kind of mapped out a lot of different ideas for what we wanted to do for this book series and and said, you know what, if if this flops, I mean, if if nobody buys it, if it doesn't generate any interest, what's the one book we would want to actually produce and, and have, you know, public? And and that was The Law. It was a children's adaptation of Frederick Bastiat's The Law. That book has been so persuasive for so many people, uh, Elijah and myself included, that we said, this this is the one book if... If no other book in the series gets made, this book needs to exist. And so we chose that for our first book. And uh, not really knowing who our core audience, <coughs> excuse me, not really knowing who our core audiences would be, uh, we figured libertarians who've read the the original book might want to get it for their kids. We figured homeschoolers might like it, and and really that community has exceeded our expectations. Just the homeschoolers are, are gobbling up these books like crazy. Um, so the idea is that there's uh, Tuttle twins, Ethan and Emily, um, and they go through various experiences and uh, learn from different mentors about some of these key ideas. And, and the story is fun. It's not like a lecture style or anything didactic or anything. It's, it's just a fun story that conveys these ideas and exposes the kids to uh, some of these important concepts. And and really, I mean, you know, deprecating myself quite a bit. It's it's Elijah's illustrations that sell the book. Uh, they are phenomenal drawings, and the kids just love them. The the story really comes alive. You know, I, I see some other children's books that have very rudimentary drawings uh, that just aren't that good. And um, and you know, if if those illustrations were on my book, this series would have gone nowhere. But Elijah's illustrations have just help this book sell, these books, I should say, sell like crazy. And so um, we're planning probably about eight to ten books total in the series. We have, I've got them right here. So we've got, our first book was uh, The Tuttle Twins Learn About the Law. So there's Ethan and Emily, and you can see he's holding a copy of the law. And Tomatoes is one of the little kind of object lesson uh things in the book that, that you learn about why those are important. But this was our first book, and uh, there's Frederick Bastiat on the back. Um, and this came out last April, so it's been less than a year. And uh, the reception was just amazing. And so we said, you know what, let's let's keep it going. All of the profit from the book, we you know, we're funneling revenue back into the production of subsequent books. And so the second book, we said, well, the first book was based on uh, the law, it's kind of political philosophy. So for the second, we want to do economics. And so we picked um, I Pencil by Leonard Reed for uh, you know your viewers who aren't familiar with that. It's, uh, it's written in the 50s, I think, uh, by Leonard Reed. And it's a, a basically a fun way to understand spontaneous order in the economy that even a simple pencil, nobody knows how to make because it its various re uh, parts require all sorts of different people, each of whom are working together, sometimes without even knowing it, uh, spanning this great complex web of human interaction that isn't coordinated by any central uh, you know, person or company. Um, and, and yet a pencil is produced without, without any, uh, you know, intervention on anyone's part. And so we said, that's, that's a really fun concept that we decided to take. So now our second book is the Tuttle Twins and the Miraculous Pencil. Uh, in Leonard Reed's essay, he calls the pencil a miracle because of, you know, the spontaneous order and the fact that it's produced because of these harmonious, uh, uh, interactions between people. And so in this story, the kids go on like a field trip 
uh, to a, a factory where you know pencils and pens and backpacks and notebooks and things like that are made. And so they learn all about how a pencil is made, and and um, they're kind of presented with these scenarios of you know could you make a pencil on your own? What if you had to you know travel across the world to gather the material? What if there were no planes and boats or things for you that other people have made? You know if you had to do everything yourself, could you do it? And the obvious answer is no. And so the kids learn about economics in the market, and and really, um, you know, from as I kind of beta tested the story with my own kids and with other uh, families' children as well, the fun thing was that it really combated a lot of entitlement mentality because rather than an iPad sitting on my lap or you know the dinner meal or whatever. Uh, we would begin to have conversations of, you know, what's the family tree? Because in the book, they learn the family tree of the pencil, all the different, you know, materials working together. So we'd say, what's the family tree of this meal that we're eating right now? You know, mom is part of the family tree because she helped make it. And the lady at the grocery store, you know, and the farmer and the, you know, truck driver and everything else. And it really instilled a sense of wonder that, oh, wow, you know, this meal sitting in front of me, there were like thousands of people involved in making, you know, chili or whatever. Um, and so it, it really combats a sense of entitlement because it helps infuse uh, a sense of wonder back into all these different products and stuff that we have. So we're working on book three right now. Uh, as I said, we'll, we'll probably do eight to ten. We'll release one or two a year. They, they take quite a while to develop a, a really good story, to, to draw everything. Uh, but the response has been fantastic, and it's so fun because there's nothing like it at all. Uh, a lot of parents who really value these key ideas of liberty want to convey them to their children and previously have had no way of doing it. Um, and so you know, now that we've provided them a vehicle to do so, um, and one that's been pretty effective, we, we've heard a lot of good you know, results and conversations and kids learning this kind of stuff and uh, you know, even challenging their parents, like in the first book with the law, you know, we talk about legal plunder. That's one of Bastiat's things that, you know, there's plunder. And then when it becomes uh, sanctioned by law, it's supposedly legal plunder. And so hearing kids asking their parents, well, you know, if legal plunder is bad, then why are taxes okay? You know, and so think of like the average conservative homeschooling mom who is suddenly being asked, you know, why taxes are immoral if legal plunder is bad. Um, it's been a lot of fun to to see some of the results coming from it. So we'll uh, we're definitely going to keep going. So have you had any <clears throat> any mothers who who have bought this for their kids and then they they email you like my kid is now re now questioning taxes? What did you do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and even the, the 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 subtle sneaky thing is it's even the parents themselves. So like at the end of the book, uh, for the first book, for example, they get done reading the story, and then the little Frederick Bastiat character is there and says, you know, hey parents, what you just read is a little a simplification of the original book I wrote. You know, the Law by Frederick Bastiat, and uh, here's how you can get it for a dollar. Uh, here are a few select quotes. And so then the parents are getting exposed to these ideas. Many of these parents that end up buying our books are not libertarian at all. You know, They're just kind of an independent-minded homeschooler maybe or a conservative that values freedom or likes the Constitution but hasn't read any of these original works at all. And so it's kind of a, a sneaky way on our part to to educate people generally, starting with the kids, fun story. Uh, we have workbooks that we produce. So once the kids read the book, um, they can then go do all sorts of activities to kind of reinforce the ideas that they learned about in the book. Um, and so it really generates a lot of family discussions and things uh, that, that's great for us because we're, we're reaching bigger audiences than just you know the seven-year-old reading the book. Yeah, and you know what's amazing? Uh, we, we spoke about this a little earlier that um, you know, we all come into this, this um, field uh, from a different angle, right? Maybe some of, so someone is uh, starts off, you know, by learning about precious metals, central banking, whereas mm -hmm. other people start off by learning about GMOs and vaccines. Other people start off by homeschooling, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then that's your foot in the door, and then you know a whole new world opens up, and you're like, wait a minute, there's something more to this, <laughs> just homeschooling, right? <laughs> Yeah, you end up finding yourself in these same circles with so many other people that when we when we first started working on these books, we figured libertarians, you know, are going to be the biggest audience. And so we got a booth at Freedom Fest, which is every July in Las Vegas for, you know, mostly libertarians and and uh, and had a good response. But the thing about Freedom Fest is it's mostly mostly like older people, <laughs> you know, or yeah. people who never had kids or maybe their grandparents or something. <laughs> and so then we started going to homeschooling conventions and oh my gosh, these mothers were like mobbing us trying to get you know wow. the copies before they ran out it, wow. it's 
it's been so much fun because these homeschooling moms, yeah, they run in these different circles and they have these different experiences, but they haven't had the foot in the door yet. You know, you talk about these different ways you can get the foot in the door for liberty and, and they haven't yet done so. And so we're we're kind of doing it through their children, through, you know, once we simplify the law down to like an eight-year-old's understanding, well, then a, a busy mom who doesn't have time to read, you know, a, a book um, – can really grasp those fundamentals just like their eight-year-old kid can. I mean, obviously, we're simplifying them quite a bit. We're putting them in a, a fun little story, but it gets people thinking, whether an eight-year-old kid or a you know forty-year-old woman. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, another thing that that you reminded me. So, in the, in the miraculous pencil, you know, talking about spontaneous order, how it reminds people how surrounded we are in anarchy basically <laughs> you know how, yeah. how you know we we think that we live in a, such a statist you know centrally planned economy whereas the majority of our lives is anarchic you know we make our own decisions with many different um you know choices that we do on a daily basis right we you know what time you want to wake up what do you want to eat where do you want to go you know what do you want to wear <laughs> you know right yeah. how do you want to wear your hair so so anarchy really surrounds us and and some statists i think don't realize the extent to which anarchy surrounds us, and and how that's beautiful, right? And and how how you know um, that's how you know plentiful <laughs> the productivity of our society you know has resulted from, right? And uh, and and it's kind of funny, you know, especially with with communists or anarcho communists, you know, how they start bashing capitalism, you know, <laughs> by using a laptop, <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> or by or using their iPhone, yeah, right. with or they or they buy. T-shirts from like you can you would say a capitalist you know uh, you know which with the, with the face of like you know uh, Che or, uh, <laughs> or, or I don't know who else um, or Mar you know Karl Marx I don't know <laughs> it's just kind of funny they use capitalism or the the products of capitalism to bash to attack capitalism. It. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think what you said a moment ago is exactly right. That like a lot of times I don't know I find that like the very people who are arguing against these things don't really understand the very principles that actually would you know have their whole world dismantled they're they're having to suppress all those different ideas yeah. because if they if they kind of paused a moment to consider them they'd realize that like you know that like none of, no, it doesn't work the whole framework that they're operating on just doesn't even uh uh, function. They, it requires ignoring such a massive amount of information. Uh, you know, I, I love how you said that. You know, anarchy is everywhere. I mean, as I think about how like the pencil is made, and that like, okay, well, if one supplier of of paint runs out or shuts down, goes bankrupt, you're automatically transitioning on your own. You don't need the central planning mechanism. You don't need to be told what to do. The market functions on its own. And and I love examples like that because it shows people who don't understand what anarchy is or, or fear it that it is all over the place. That that you know we're comfortable with it. That that we're Works well, uh, but we take it for granted, and that's why I like stories like eye pencils because it uses just a simple object lesson, a simple thing like a pencil, to help people understand a much larger concept. Um, it's it's a very disarming thing to talk about a simple pencil, but then the extension of that is to consider you know interpersonal relationships, geopolitics, you know, like everything else that that the same lessons apply. Um, I, I'm really fascinated by that just because it, it's everywhere and yet we take it for granted um, and we need to kind of refresh our mind that, oh yeah, this is, it actually works and things turn out all right. In fact, things turn better. I don't read a lot of fiction. I'm not much of a, a, a fiction reader, but I do love dystopian fiction and I love it because it shows what happens if you were to have like full communism or, or you know, tyranny or whatever that if, if, Anar the anarchy that we take for granted in the market was shut down and suppressed or centrally planned and controlled. And it's really alarming. People read this stuff or go watch the movies now that are you know coming out based on some of the, these dystopian works and they see how alarming it is. And yet they're comfortable with like a limited amount of tyranny, right? Like, okay, if, if the state just existed and we're limited to this, then things would be okay. But when it's expanded to this, holy cow, this is awful and you know we need to fight it. Um, they're comfortable with this much anarchy, but you know when it's totally suppressed, then things are bad. Um, and it's just that inconsistency, I think, is where we battle to try and get people to understand that you know we need full freedom, not just you know mostly freedom. Yeah, yeah. It's like you want you want uh, you know um, 
limited theft or zero theft, <laughs> right. <laughs> right? You know, and partial rape or complete rape. <laughs> yeah. you know, it doesn't quite work that way. <laughs> and and you know, Larkin Rose uh, discusses a lot of this um, in a very um, you know simplified way. That's why I love following him. You know, he talks about like if you were in charge of the jungle, and you were the you know the dictator, and you chose which species, which plants, which fungus lived and died which one you would support which one you would you know you know control and subjugate and quarantine how would you know what what decisions would you make there's and no way how does it work there's no one in charge well no it's it's not just one person that would need to all that we could have a group of people a committee and they together would decide you know eight <laughs> people and we could you know like just yeah it's it's so arrogant of us to think that we can understand and control everything and and that we delegate you know because we are ignorant or fearful or whatever we delegate to these groups of people that their only claim to power is that they won a popularity contest an election you know like mm -hmm. these people are not smarter than anyone else we shouldn't allow them to have control of our lives and yet people are so comfortable doing that because they don't want to put forward the time or the energy or you know step a foot you know into the darkness not knowing what's going to happen and have some faith they're they're so terrified or paralyzed that they just want other people to control their lives for them um and they don't see the beauty of what they've given up you know that's i think our challenge is to help them under i love how jeff tucker just he does this all with a smile on his face he helps mm -hmm. people see that freedom is infectious it's it's wonderful and joyful and amazing it's not just fighting against the machine it's enjoying life it's embracing the anarchy that's all around us and helping people understand that freedom and and you know being uh, having voluntary choices is an ideal, right? It, it's what we want. It, we shouldn't. The problem with libertarians overall, uh, present company included, in my own past life, is that we tend to be very pessimistic and we tend to just fight against things. There's a great story from early American history I love on this, where it's uh, John Adams and Tom Paine. A lot of people don't remember or or know that John Adams, you know, people think, oh, Tom Paine, he was so great, he wrote these essays and really kind of fanned the flames of early American revolution. And John Adams didn't like him, didn't like what he was doing. And he'd write to his wife, Abigail, you know, they corresponded quite often. And he, his main concern, as he had told Abigail, was that uh, Tom Paine was just tearing down. Right? He was just saying, down with monarchy, down with power, down, 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 down. Mm -hmm. And it was effective and it was whipping up a lot of people into this anti-monarchy uh, fervor. But John Adams was concerned. Why was he concerned? Because he was worried that as people would start tearing down these institutions of power, they wouldn't know what to replace them with. They wouldn't know what to do in, in their absence. They wouldn't have the intellectual tools or the philosophical background or the statesmanship to be able to understand what needed to be put in, in place. And so that's where he saw his own work in trying to provide models of good governance. We might, from a voluntary standpoint, object to kind of some of the proposals that he was doing, but we can't object to the fact that Transitionally, it was much more freedom oriented than what they were living under, you know, under a monarchy. He was trying to offer solutions to say, okay, as we tear this down, here's something we can install in its place. We might suggest something different. We might suggest personal responsibility and freedom, you know, absolute. But uh, you have to hand it to the guy for realizing that we can't just be pessimistic. We can't just complain and criticize and tear down. We need to have proposals. We need to have solutions. We need to help people see the ideals and the implementation and the practicality of what we're talking about. It's not just theoretics. It's not just you know uh, pontificating and and you know philosophy. It's real world stuff, and this stuff works and it functions and it happens all the time. We just help need to help people understand that so that as we try and tear down the state and and decentralize and everything, that you know things are going to be okay. Not only are things going to be okay, they're going to be great. They're going to be better. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing how the word, you know, the words such as capitalism and profit and money are dirty words to so many people. You know, you, you just say to so, just say to somebody, you know, we should privatize everything, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and how so many people would recoil at that idea. Like what? Right. But that's just for, for profit. They're just they just care about the bottom line. <laughs> right. But but my roads. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And and the other idea that I I like to to discuss with people is um, something that I actually believed in when I was younger because I I used to read a lot of Plato uh, and the Republic, right? His book, The Republic, and and he did, where he discussed the utopia of uh, philosopher kings, right? So he says once the, the the philosophers were kings and the kings were philosophers, that would be the ideal society right yeah but um 
But I think that uh, even then, you know, even a philosopher cannot rule a population without doing harm to some groups of people, right? Because it's completely, I think it's completely impossible, like for one person or even a small group of people to rule millions of people and not think that you're going to have, you know, harmful and un unintended consequences as a result, right? Nobody has the foresight to, you know, to envision what will happen, you know, with one uh, policy and, and the, the multiple repercussions that's going to happen down the road, right? Nobody has that ability of vision. <laughs> I, I think the key difference that I see a lot of times is arrogance versus humility. It's arrogant of me to think that I know your life, you know, such that I should control it or that a group of people understand you or your neighbors well enough that they should control you. I mean, that's arrogance. It, it is absolute arrogance to think that we can centrally manage people's lives and try and micromanage the minutia through you know, bureaucratic regulations. Whereas it's, it's humility to say, I don't know your life better than you do. I'm, I'm going to defer to you. You do what you think is best. You do what you think is right. Just leave me alone and let's make sure that we respect one another's property and boundaries and, and let's just get along. I mean, it, it's such a different approach to take that I think if we, if we do it correctly, we can attract a lot of people. You look at like the great intellectual giants of history and those that were humble really had an endearing quality that they, they turned into leaders. They, they inspired a lot of people. Whereas the you know the arrogant dictators of yesteryear, you know, were having to do everything by force, and they were having to bark orders at people and and command obedience to what they said rather than leading. Um, and I prefer to be a leader rather than you know a manager or a dictator. I think we all do, and so I just like that contrast that it's it's humility to say freedom works. You know, I respect your life. I ask that you respect mine. Doesn't mean, you know, I won't defend my life or defend my property or whatnot. But I see such a contrast there that I think we often don't focus on uh, when we talk about these abstract political concepts. It really comes down to just, I don't, I don't know your life. I'm not going to attempt to control it. I got enough of my own issues to worry about. You know, I'm not going to bother with you. Yeah, yeah, that, that reminds me of another another idea that people have when I talk about volunteerism and anarchy is, um, you know, they say if there's no government, it's just, everybody's going to be out for themselves, nobody's going to think of their neighbor, you know, we're just going to be selfish <laughs> individuals, right. you know, who cares about, you know, your neighbor, um, and uh, I think that's, that's just a basic misunderstanding of, uh, you know, how people react and how people, you know, like even today with where, where massive um, percentages of our income are stolen through taxation and inflation, um, people still find the find you know enough money to give to other people right through charities. Mm -hmm. They still do even after all of that theft. <laughs> so to say that you know when all of that is removed, when there is no taxation, and you know just not even not even mentioning the fact that everyone's going to be much wealthier. You know, of course, <laughs> I think that uh, you know poverty will you know be de decreased to a negligible amount because not only will because the barriers to entry in the job market be you know uh, van will vanish but also just because you know people already do have the desire to help their neighbor right and to give to those people in need i think the pencil example going back to it uh, explains that really well we have a, an object like a pencil because of people's self-interest all throughout the entire family tree of that object People, you know, a waitress serving a meal to a logger, she's interested in making money to pay her rent and, you know, go to school. The logger has an interest in providing for his family. The guy who, you know, builds the truck for them has an interest himself. Uh, the, the owner of the, you know, manufacturing plant where the pencil is assembled has his own interest. He's looking out for himself. All along the entire chain of everything that we take for granted, including, you know, the computer that we're using right now and the clothes I'm wearing and everything else – it self interest infuses everything and i th i don't think we should fear it. in fact you look at poverty today versus poverty 100 years ago the impoverished people today have cell phones and tvs and refrigerators and toilets and you know what i mean like the standard of living has been so substantially increased even if not especially for those who are below a poverty line um, even in, in Africa, right? I mean, they're getting the trickle down of all the used cell phones that no one wants anymore and the clothes and everything else. Um, 
I spent a, you know, a few weeks in Africa a few years back and, and it's a kind of a different story and not, not totally. There are plenty of places where, you know, they still don't enjoy a lot of that side benefit. But I think the best way that we can be helping people is, is innovation and, you know, advancement and progress and, and the economy. I, I just don't see central planning, you know, doing much about it other than introducing barriers. Oh yeah. Making, yeah, making things more difficult, you know, imposing <laughs> tariffs and, you know, registration fees and licensing fees. <laughs> yeah. And minimum wages and, you know, various things like that. But, um, but you know, you're, you're right that, you know, if, if we do want to help the poor, we do want to help the disabled and, you know, the infirm, then the, for, the first thing that you do is to remove the barriers. You know, it's not, it's not to give more money to the, to the controllers who will make it, make it even more difficult for the producers, you know, and the entrepreneurs to innovate, <laughs> you know, it's just going to compound the problem, right? You, you yeah. just have to, we just have to stop doing, they're doing enough. <laughs> just stop, just stop doing whatever it is well, you're doing. And that's it. It's, it's ironic when, you know, these policies exacerbate the very problem that they are aimed to solve. You know, a lot of these policies are, are just self-reinforcing where these people end up in this cycle where they can't get out of poverty. And I think the best way to get them out of it is to, you know, give them a job and provide, you know, uh, attain low prices for these objects that they want. I mean, you look at like healthcare, one of the biggest things that, that poor people struggle with. There's no price discovery in healthcare. You can't shop around your doctor. No one knows what it costs. These folks just end up in the emergency room. You know, nobody knows what the prices are, and yet if you had price discovery and you could compete between doctors or or hospitals or you know medical institutions, those prices would begin to plummet. Um, and so I think really the market is the best way to solve a lot of this stuff. The, the problem, the challenge I think that we have is providing those solutions, providing those real world examples to help dispel people's knee jerk reactions that, oh, people will die in the streets or you hate children or whatever. We <laughs> need to help people understand that, that liberty works. It's not just, you know, sitting here and pon pontificating about these abstract concepts that it's, it's actually going to improve people's lives. It's actually going to make life more enjoyable and help more people than the status quo. We we need to be practical about what we're talking about. That yes, anarchy is great. Yes, you know, we should talk about liberty, but but it's not just for, you know, talking about in in you know book clubs on a Friday night. It's this is like, you know, pounding the pavement and and, and improving the world. It's it's changing people's lives for the better. Yeah, yeah, and it's kind of funny that when I when I talk about this with certain people, especially my family, <laughs> uh, they uh, which my family most of them are Democrats, right? So I, I get I get accused of being a Republican. You know, what right wing <laughs> nut are you listening to? <laughs> and I'm like, no, I'm off the spectrum, off the spectrum. <laughs> I'm not one of those anymore. Um, not that I really never really used to be, um, but. But that's the thing, you know. It's either you're, either you're, you know, liberal or conservative, Democrat or Republican. You know, there's no, there's nothing else, right? That they can't. It's like people don't understand that life does go on without dictators and tyrants and presidents and prime ministers and you know, you know, yeah. chancellors and just people who whose sole desire is to use, you know, stolen funds to meddle and uh, you know, <laughs> make people's lives difficult. For the purposes of your, protecting, you know, the public welfare, national security, it's all for your own good, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I think it all boils down to a root fear. Like, people fear, you know, uh, having a, an intruder invade their home. They fear a terrorist attack. They, they fear, you know, losing a job and, and not being able to provide their family. They, they fear getting sick and not being able to afford medical bills. It, the, the love of the state comes down to the fear of the unknown. Mm. And this fear leads people, I think, to to abdicate their liberty because they, at the end of the day, they say, "I I I want safety rather than freedom." Right? I, I just want to be comfortable. I want to know that I can kind of rely on on the government to help me out if I need. So in the meantime, I'm okay helping other people so that I can rely on that same system. Um, you know, it's it's uh, you know, people prefer the temp. Uh, what was the Thomas Jefferson quote? Uh, um, you know, timid men prefer the the uh, calm of despotism to the tempestuous sea of liberty, and I think that encapsulates it perfectly. Right? People want the calm of despot. They're okay with despotism as long as it provides them a sense of calm. They don't want like the you know 
uh, rioting in the streets and bank runs. And they don't want chaotic despotism. They want calm despotism. They're okay with the state. They're okay with violations of liberty as long as their lives are calm. They don't want a tempestuous sea of liberty where things are unpredictable and no one's planning for them. And and uh, and that, I think, at the end of the day is what it boils down to. It's, it's fear. Um, people just want to be kept safe. And and the hard thing that that's a tough sell for a voluntarist to say, you know what? You need to be brave enough to tolerate those tempestuous seas because liberty is worth it. Uh, because we can't promise safety, we can't promise utopia. The thing is, the state can't either. You know, we can show the state for the great fiction that, that it is that you know, even with all the police and the military, these things still happen. In fact, probably more so than they otherwise would because they're meddling in other people's affairs and triggering some of this blowback. But at the end of the day, we have to say, look, life is unpredictable. Life, you go drive the kids to school or to the store or whatever. Uh, you know, that's a risk. You risk dying. <laughs> Right, it's a very real risk, and yet we commonly do it. We don't even think about it. Think, you know, it's just fine. We don't calculate that risk anymore. But everything we do in life is a risk, and people need to understand that 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 pervades life. That is life. Life is a you know series of calculation of risks, cost benefit analysis to say, do I want to do that? Is it worth it? Is it too risky? Uh, people just they they worry about those those bigger fears, the the criminal, the terrorist, the whatever, and they can't calculate that risk. They they don't know how to quantify it and say, well, maybe I won't go out today, or maybe I won't go to the sports stadium or the airport. Um, and so we we want we collectively people generally want the state. They want you know oh those all seeing people who can kind of watch that stuff for us and make sure that that those criminals or those terrorists stay at bay or they can tell me where it's safe to go or which countries I can fly to. I think it just all comes down to fear, and we just need to show people that uh, they need to overcome that fear, and that doing so is is liberating, right? Where you can realize that life is a series of calculation risks, that it's okay. Uh, but that you don't need that that supposed comfort of the state because the exchange isn't worth it. It's not worth having despotism for this uh, perceived sense of calm, that liberty is really a net positive. And, and I think we need to make a harder sell for that with a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. Like um, that reminds me of uh, Nietzsche's quote um, <clears throat> that this, everything the state says is a lie and everything it has – is stolen, yeah. right? And pe- people have to understand that. And, and and why is that? Like when you tell, if you tell somebody that, they're going to say that's impossible. What? Why? What are you talking about? President Obama just gave a State of the Union. He's going to make fifteen dollar minimum wage. That's a good thing. How can you say that's bad? <laughs> you know, he's looking out for the small guy. Who? Who's looking out for the small guy? Nobody, right? At least he's right. looking out for the small guy, right? <laughs> <coughs> and and uh, it's just uh, it's it's just kind of funny that. Um, you know, they think you know a couple of old guys on on Capitol Hill is gonna you know save the day for three hundred million people <laughs> around the country. You know, they're gonna they're gonna lift all of us out of poverty with you know free money and free college, <laughs> free health care, <laughs> everything. Well, and it's again, it's arrogance. It's arrogance to yeah. think that that's possible, and it it also relies on forgetfulness. People don't go back and realize that all those promises that have been made and all those other claims that have been made were utter crap, you know, and unfulfilled. And and people don't have that institutional knowledge to say, well, wait a minute, you told me last time that <laughs> minimum wage would go to twelve dollars and it didn't happen, and now you're saying fifteen, and you know, I'm supposed to believe you. No one approaches things that way, right? They get their soundbite media. And the media clearly doesn't do any journalism at all, so they don't present that context for people to understand that. People are just being swept along in this cycle of lies. Uh, you know, I mean, they're living in the Matrix. The Matrix is such a good example. They're just being fed this constant stream of, of falseness. Um, I, I think our job is to kind of wake those people up. Let me let me pitch one more thing. I talked about my books, and the reason why I was hammering home fear is is I wrote yeah. a book about it. Yeah, this yeah. Is, so this this is for adults. It's called Fear Done, How Politicians Exploit Your Emotions and What You Can Do to Stop It. Um, and the website is just feardonebook.com. And, uh, and so I wrote this book mainly for that reason because I saw in my own life how I was being swept along with all that fear mongering you know, about a decade ago. And, and, uh, and then once I kind of got out of that cycle, I just saw that it's persistent. A lot of people are just kind of subjected to the same thing. They live that life of fear. And so they love the state because the state is telling people that, you know, we'll absolve your fears, we'll keep you safe. And so people grow this adoration for the state because they want the comfort, they want the calm of despotism. And so uh, the, the book is my way to say, well, first, let's, let's look at the context, right? Like, 
in order to understand, to, to not relive history, we need to understand it so we can break free from that cycle. So we look at some historical uses of fear, some modern uses of fear, and then in the end propose some solutions to say, you know what, here's how you can kind of step out of it and, and get away from living that life of fear. Here's actual practical things that you can do uh, to try and kind of step away from that and not let yourself be affected by it anymore. Um, I, I think at the end of the day, liberty is an individual thing. Like it takes each of us kind of unplugging from the system or doing things differently, approaching life a little bit differently, interacting with one another differently. And in the aggregate, that that sum total of all those effects of people living differently and, and treating one another you know, more harmoniously is going to produce just a groundswell of liberty. And so I wanted in the book to say like, you know, you can't change the system. You're not going to change all the propaganda. You're not going to change the media or whatever, but you can change you. And here's how you can try and have like a better sense of what happens and how you can counteract it so that even though it's happening to everybody else, you know, to use that matrix example again, you're, you're taking the, the right pill to kind of, you know, get out of the system and not be subjected to it anymore. So it's a, it's a topic I'm really passionate about because I just see it happening everywhere. And the sad thing is like every every big thing, you know, whether it's this measles outbreak or Ebola or ISIS or whatever, everything is just saturated in fear. And we're told, oh, you know, this government program or this new policy or, you know, this new taxation spending or whatever, you know, is going to solve the problem. And it never does. And it's always just, you know, total crap. Uh, but people are just swept along in that cycle and they don't anticipate it they don't counteract it and so i wrote feardom because i wanted to be able to to kind of help people combat that in their own lives yeah 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 i think it was voltaire that said um um you know if you want to change the world first you tend to your own garden yeah right? <laughs> love, love that quote right and and uh and also another idea about volunteerists is that um you know everybody everybody understands that you know you love your family and you would defend them, and you love your close friends, right? And you would defend them. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Everybody else is evil. <laughs> my, my neighbor is screwed. You know, like I don't you care know, about that. I'm gonna vote for a guy who's gonna steal more from my neighbor. That's fine, but not for my friends and not for my family. Leave them alone, <laughs> right? Not in my backyard. Where, right? Whereas, yeah, whereas volunteerists, we understand that you know, if you <clears throat> love your your friends and family, you know, you know, why would you not? consider the rest of humanity in the same vein you know we're all just people right you know there there's iranians mexicans you know peruvians australians but in the end we're all just people and we all have most of mostly the same sort of goals right you know you know <laughs> get stay uh, keep a good job make enough money put food on the table educate your kids raise your kids well right like that those are general ideas that we all share and and that we we have most often in common more often in common than we do with our own government and I Right. Yeah, I, no, I, I love that. I mean, I think that's a perfect summary point of everything we've been talking about, that liberty to me is love, right? It's, it's a love of others rather than a love of self. Uh, you know, power is definitely a love of self. It, it's arrogant. It's, you know, assuming. It's controlling. Uh, the love of others, I mean, you know, everyone else. I, I love how you put it. You know, I, I say that at the end of Feardom, that um, – other other people have the same rights and interests and passions as we do, you know, that everything you just articulated, they have a family and they have passions and they have hopes for the future. And clearly there are bad actors. There are people who are just evil or there's people who are just bent on <clears throat> ruining other people's lives or whatever. And we need to deal with that and we, you know, that's fine. It's not saying that we should necessarily be pacifists or that we should just smoke peace pipes all day. There, there are threats, I think, that we need to kind of anticipate and, and respond to. But, you know, 99.999% of people, you know, we could be friends with. We could just have just this a, a huge emotional bond with. We could, if we had the opportunity to sit down face to face, we would find so much common ground and come away with a new friend and a pen pal. And, you know, we just don't have that opportunity. Technology helps us. We can Skype with people. In fact, where are you at right now? Uh, New York. New York, okay, so I'm in Utah, right? I mean, like, it, it breaks down all these barriers, and I Skype with friends in Honduras or Africa or whatever, <clears throat> and I think I, I'm really excited about technology, you know, for that reason, that it really decentralizes stuff and, and helps facilitate liberty a lot more. So, I, I, summary point, I love that, right? It's all about love. It's treating other people as I would want to be treated. It's basic golden rule, you know, but but as as basic as it is, a lot of people don't apply it they they put in all these exceptions to the rules so that like like you say okay for my family 
you know, between siblings, you need the golden rule. But oh, between you know somebody in Afghanistan and me, nah, it doesn't doesn't work that way. You know, <laughs> I think we need to tear down those exceptions and show that you know it is about love. Well, let me just let me just correct you on one point you made. Uh, this yeah. Skype call is costing me too much. I had to sacrifice a couple of days of of uh, you know work just just to afford <laughs> a long distance fees, right? <laughs> 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 yeah, exactly. Like, like, how much did long distance calls cost people? Right? Yeah. Just, just like what a decade ago or something. Yeah. You know, it's like it's like um, you know, it's like first you have to ask, wait, wait, where's this person living, and is that considered long distance? <laughs> what area code is yeah. it? Wait, it's after ten o'clock at night, so I have unlimited minutes now. I, know, I can right? call people. You know, <laughs> it's amazing how. How you know, you know, people's standard of living has improved, and like you said, the poverty, the people who are who are considered uh, impoverished today are living perhaps better than you know the kings and pharaohs of you know the past, the you know the ancient past, and uh, and we have to recognize that that you know technology and innovation, capitalism, that's what it has done. It has given people you know um, wealth and comfort. <laughs> that we would you know that that we have never had and Absolutely. and also it has decreased the price of it right that it's it becomes all of a sudden affordable like how many people had a cell phone i don't know like i don't know like a decade ago right how many people had a cell phone right <laughs> or like 15 years ago and now it's like just everywhere, right? Like you said, Africa, you know, <laughs> they're just getting our leftover cell phones. <laughs> well, they, you know, we had, we had cell phones a decade ago, but we also had CD players and we had cameras and we had radios and all these things that are now combined into a cell phone, right? And, I and mean, calculators? Like, yeah, calculators. <laughs> what, are, what are those? I remember being at the Smithsonian as a teenager and we were walking through and they had all these like stuff from you know the sixties or whatever, and and we found my dad. We were with my I was with my family as a teenager, and my dad's like, "Hey, that's the calculator I used in high school." <laughs> <laughs> it felt so old, but but I love it. You know, technological progress is really going to solve a lot of problems. I mean, you look at like Bitcoin, right? I mean, the fact that you can now do micropayments to people in third world countries and avoid Western Union and you know and and them kind of capitalizing on people and taking a lot of their money, like. Technology is such a blessing and, and you know, and it allows us to have these conversations. It allows us to spread love. It allows us to familiarize ourselves with people all around the world that we otherwise wouldn't. And and no longer is like these people on the other side of the world like, you know, oh, I read about them in a book or whatever. Now we can watch them on YouTube or we can interact with them on Skype or whatever. It's just it's going to help a lot of things, I think. Well, can you, why don't you comment on the uh, the Luddite fallacy? Of you know people who uh, you know say that technology is destroying jobs and eventually we're going to be you know all put out of the job or <laughs> going to be yeah. you know, I don't know Terminator is going to come right going to rise up <laughs> or whatever. What would you I, I think I think it's just ignorant, right? Because like okay, here you have a cell phone right here that yeah you don't need Walkmans anymore or you, know, you don't need these like calculator manufacturers. Although you do, they specialize. You have graphing calculators and stuff like that. But uh, but then you have a cell phone that kind of uh, uh, you know encapsulates some other technologies, removes the need for some jobs, but it just rearranges things because now you have a cell phone where you can have app developers and you can have all these things. It unleashes all this new potential. You know, it, it, to me, every technological innovation is is just breaking through to kind of yield a whole bunch of other opportunities that didn't exist. So it's not that, you know, that person, we don't need that job anymore. It's like here's it, it removes one opportunity, but it produces a far better one. Yes, we don't need antiquated technology anymore, but hey, this exciting new technology, you know, we need a lot of people who know how to do it and <clears throat> how to kind of further, you know, the the program <laughs> or the technology. People, I think, just they fear retooling they fear having to learn new things and so they just want to protect their job and say i just want to keep doing this they're not you know ready to be dynamic and the market changes right i mean we need to anticipate that and and if we really believe in the market we can't oppose you know market changes that that might be uh, impacting us personally uh, i get really you know upset when i see a lot of people it's a very human it's human nature, right, to kind of protect what's yours. Mm -hmm. And so even even some liberty minded people I see who kind of, they get kind of protective and and they, they want, you know, to be shielded from that change. I say, no, we should we should be embracing that. If anything, we should be anticipating it, knowing that it's gonna come and trying to kind of figure out ways that we can you know be ready for it or pivot or change or or harness it 
for even greater opportunity. Like now that you have Bitcoin, you have all these new markets opening up and new opportunities that didn't exist before. And so, yeah, maybe it puts some people out of jobs. Maybe it, you know, may, uh, puts Western Union into the tank in the next five years. But that's fine. You know, all those people are going to find jobs. They're going to find other opportunities. And now we have this whole Bitcoin ecosystem providing economic opportunities for people that didn't exist before. It's Again, it comes down to fear. It's fear of the unknown, fear of the future. People don't know what's going to happen. They just want to, you know, be content with the status quo. Um, we we just need to be willing to take that risk and, <clears throat> and sail the sea, the tempestuous sea of liberty. Yeah, yeah, well put. I mean, I mean, imagine if, uh, you know, when the the first um, you know Model T car came out, if the federal government decided to um, subsidize the horse and buggy industry. Right to, <clears throat> to protect them from the evil, you know, <laughs> the evil car. And we see that we see that happening right now with Uber and Lyft. You know, yeah. all the taxis fighting it and all the subsidies that they get. It's we see this battle play out so often, right? You know, Tesla and mm -hmm. and the big car manufacturers and everything. It's it's uh, it's not surprising to see it play out time and again because it is. It's human nature to protect what's yours and and to you know commandeer the power of the state in your behalf. To, to protect it. So it's disappointing, but very, very, very predictable. Yeah, yeah, it happens over and over again. Um, so so uh, let's, why don't we finish up? Uh, can you just um, explain to us about your um, homeschooling method with your kids? Yeah, I do. Um, you know, my oldest uh, is just about to turn six, and so we're still kind of at the beginning stages. But I've given it a lot of thought and uh, and and talked to a lot of folks about something. Uh, you know, I now do presentations at homeschooling conventions on this, and that is um, passion-driven education. So it's more of an unschooling approach. But what it is is it's basically trying to customize the child's education to whatever their passion is. There's a lot of good books and a lot of TED Talks and stuff that kind of touch on this a little bit here and there. Uh, there's one by a boy named Logan called Hack Schooling, right, where yeah. he tries to hack together his his schooling experience. And, and it's a good example of what I'm talking about where he his passion was skiing. And he says that for him writing was really boring because – uh, you know, he didn't want to write about flowers or about dinosaurs. He wanted to write about skiing, you know. And once he finally had that that uh, that freedom to do so, it just took off. And of course, he sees that if he wants to, you know, be a sports commentator, or he wants to write books or whatever, he needs to learn how to write well. He he has a passion and he has a goal, and everything else becomes just something he knows he needs to do, and he's just <coughs> excited to do it. I remember when I was in school, the three worst subjects I did was economics, education, and history. And they're the three topics that I'm now proficient <laughs> in and really enjoy doing. And it's because, you know, who wants to learn English when you have to learn the, like, third past participle <laughs> subjunctive or, you know, whatever? Like, no one wants to learn the dry semantics of the language. But when I graduated college and I sucked at writing – and I started a blog and I just started, you know, I gained a readership and I was trying to persuade people about these ideas I was learning about. I realized I needed to learn to write well. And so I didn't go crack open my English textbooks and kind of figure out, you know, like, okay, well, uh, the adjective needs to be, you know, re like I just read books and said, oh, wow, that's a really good persuasive statement. How did he do that and how can I kind of do that myself? So that freedom really allowed me to kind of, uh, um, pursue my interests a lot more and become very educated very quickly. The unfortunate thing is that it happened after college. Um, and so with my children, I want to provide it to them from the get-go. I want to say, look, you know, maybe it'll take us a little while to figure out what your passions are. And so for a while, we'll just kind of expose you to some things and see what you like and kind of just roll with it. But I, as quickly as I can, I want to find out what what their passions are. You know, if they really like dinosaurs, then let's watch dinosaur videos and let's read dinosaur books and let's build dinosaur, you know, habitats and ecosystems and let's learn geography and physics and math and, and English along the way. Like, it, it's just following what their passion is because the worst thing that anyone as student asks and it's so common is why do I have to learn this yeah, you know exactly. what, what what good is this going to do me in my life and I never want to hear that question from my kids it's for I your own wanna, good right learning. someday you'll thank me someday you know? you'll thank me <laughs> I, I want my kids to be totally invested in their own education and the best way I know how to do that is to wrap all of their educational activities around whatever their passion is. And so for little Logan and his TED Talk, it was skiing. Maybe my kid, it will be bees, you know? Like, who knows what it's going to be? 
but I want to figure out what their passions are and then just find ways to kind of teach them math and physics and English or whatever around what interests them because then I'll never be asked, why do I have to learn this? I'll say, hey, there's this, you know, uh, beekeepers conference. Maybe let's go there. And hey, maybe, you know, you could speak there. They'd love to see an eight-year-old kid speaking there. And so then we have to work through public speaking and English and whatever. You know, I, I just think it's a much better way to go. I think it's going to get my kids interested a lot more in, in taking advantage uh, of their own education, which really is what any good teacher wants. Teachers understand that all education is self-taught. They can try and push stuff on the kids, but if kids aren't aren't willing to kind of internalize it, they're not going to learn. And so identifying what a child's passion is, providing them the freedom to pursue it, and then building a, a curriculum custom around whatever their passion is, I think is all in all the best way to do it. Um, and so that's what we're going to be doing in our family. Yeah, that's awesome. My, um, yeah, I have a four-and-a-half-year-old and a two-and-a-half-year-old, and, a and, uh, and my... You know, my approach is is a quote that I like, which is, um, you know, if a child does not want to learn, nothing will convince him. And if a child wants to learn, nothing will stop him. Stop him. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely right. You know, Absolutely. and, and, and uh, with, my, with my son, my four and a half year old, he's asking a lot of questions now about machines, talking about technology. He's asking about machines and robots. You know, how do robots make clothes how do robots make shoes how do robots make toothpaste how do robots make ice cream (laughs) you know and and i can i can explain it to him but but if i'm near a computer it's even better i can show him a video and he watches it intently and it's amazing like like just imagine you know what four and a half year old would be interesting in looking at a machine or a factory making ice cream like no you would never think that a four and a half year old be interested but because he asked me then yeah. I show him, then he's interested, right? Then he's going to watch it and pay attention. <laughs> I, I think like anything else, it boils down to freedom. I mean, for me, it's the, the you know, once I had the freedom to, to learn what I wanted to learn, uh, when I wanted to learn it, you know, uh, no longer being told what to do, I just absorbed it like a sponge and now have written books and do public speaking and run a, you know, nonprofit think tank and, and things that like I would never have imagined. And freedom is what did it for me. And so I think our children need freedom. I, I, I don't think we should advocate for freedom as adults, but then not provide it to them as children. Like if we really believe in freedom and the value and the benefits, we need to expose them to it as at a young level and allow them that freedom. I, I, I mean, I, I just see so many examples of, of kids who have had that freedom, whose parents have done, you know, unschooling or whatever variant thereof. And just the results are just amazing. I mean, these people are turning out to be, you know, confident and intelligent and, and respectful and insightful and innovative and everything else. And, and I want that for my kids. Yeah. <laughs> I get asked all the time, you know, what if, what if they never learned history or math? How are they going to learn how to read and write? <laughs> they have to be forced. If you're not forced, you don't learn anything. <laughs> and and I think um, people don't realize that we're all learning all the time, right? It's not mm-hmm. like you learn, you know, Monday through Friday <laughs> between, you know, 8 and 2, <clears throat> um, you know, from September to June, you know, from the ages of five until what, 16 or 17, right? That's the only time you learn. And maybe right. four years later in college, maybe. But right. then after that, we don't learn at all. <laughs> right. So that's the problem that people think that <clears throat> that kids are somehow different. Like you said, you know, you found out how enjoyable it is to learn what you wanted to learn when you wanted to learn it. So why do we... Why do we impose this double standard on kids, mm-hmm. you know? And, I mean, you can apply this to the same thing, like, with even um, peaceful parenting, like spanking, right? Like, you know, you can, you can uh, if, you, if, you, uh, if you hit your uh, friend, it's called assault. You hit your spouse, it's called domestic abuse. You hit your child, it's called spanking. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's always yep. a double standard that we apply to them. They're, this, they're the exception, right? Like, uh, you know, same thing. Government is the exception to the, rule, the law of morality, right? <laughs> Well, I, th- I think we should model for in our own lives as parents what we want for ourselves individually as adults. Like if, if I want freedom, if I want le- people to leave me alone, you know, I, I shouldn't be saying one thing and doing another with my kids. Like I, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I want to be consistent and say this is a world I believe in and this is what I'm fighting for with other adults and, and you know, people. But, oh, I'm going to treat you differently. Oh, I'm going to, you know, force you to do this or make you do this. And, and it's hard. I mean, like, we're, we were raised, I'm sure, you know, you were as well. We were, we were raised in that kind of environment of, of coercion and authoritarianism and everything. And so trying to kind of, 
get away from that because it's almost like ingrained. I find myself like, okay, I, I want to do it this way, but I almost habitually do it this way just because it's what I'm used to. And so just reading a lot of books and a lot of practice and discussion with my wife to say, here's how I got to purge myself of this and try it a little bit different. And and so it's tough. It's it's a little bit harder when you're dealing with kids because they kind of push your buttons and they get kind of the, you know, <laughs> the the reactionary approach rather than like sitting down with an adult in a calm conversation or whatever, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's harder, but but we're trying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, you know, I think unschooling and homeschooling and peaceful parenting is actually the more difficult type of parenting you know it's yeah. so much easier i think to just go to work and then just send your kid your kid off to a government school and then just you know whatever they teach him that's what he's going to learn you know and i'm just yeah. going to make him do his homework when he gets home and that's it <laughs> that's what he's going to learn right yeah um, and then and then the other problem is when when um, parents actually think you know that they recognize the immorality of their experience in, in public school. However, they still think, you know, I still think you should go. Even though I hated it, you should still go because I went through it and you're going to have to go through it. <laughs> and or they, like, say, they say, I turned out all right. Yeah. You know, like yeah. I went through it and I turned out all right. And I say, but how much better could things have been had you had freedom, you know? Like you could have started a business when you were 12. Yeah. You could be a billionaire by now. Like you yeah. just don't know. And I get so sick of people, oh, I turned out all right. You know, <laughs> just it's not a good not a good example. Actually, what, what I say to that is, uh, you know, people tell me tell me that all the time. Look at you. You went to public school and you turned out all right. Right. And I'm, and I'm like, so does that justify immorality? Like, like if I was physically abused as a child and later became a successful entrepreneur, look at you. You were physically <laughs> abused and you turned out all right. Okay. Right. So what is that? What's the conclusion? It's okay to be physically abused. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, it's, it's never. <laughs> um, but um, all right, I don't want to take up any more of your time. Uh, so why don't you let people know, um, you know, where they can reach your websites, uh, Facebook. Sure. Yeah, uh, thanks for the interview. It's uh, been a great conversation. Um, the the Tuttle Twins books uh, you can find at tuttletwins.com. So that's T U T T L E, tuttletwins.com. And that's where the books are sold and the activity workbooks and stuff. Uh, Feardom is just at feardombook.com. Um, and then both of those websites have uh, information about me as the author, contact information and all that if if any of your viewers want to get in touch. Particularly with the Teletwins books, we're always open to ideas of what we can do for future installments of the book. We have a lot of ideas, but we've gotten some good input from people of, of things that we might change up or, or do that we hadn't otherwise considered. So uh, if any of your viewers have ideas, I'd, I'd love to hear them. Cool. And uh, so before we uh, sign off, is there any any last message you want to leave leave the audience with um i you know nothing comes to mind but just shooting from the hip of the first thing i think of you know i i've turned fighting for liberty into my full-time job so i i run libertas institute it's a non-profit uh think non-profit think tank um and we've been fortunate enough to find donors and and people who support us financially so that we can do this full-time um and i think we need more of that i think we need less you know facebook debates and and more you know, practical solutions and people finding ways to to make a career out of this. Uh, you know, I had to take a big pay cut, uh, but to me, it's worth it. I, I need. I think we need a lot more people who are enterprising and innovative. You know, division of labor, people getting engaged uh, on a much more active basis. Because you know, I see a lot of opportunity and a lot of energy spent on these debates and discussions on social media. But if if we harness that and if we applied it, like if those you know viewing this just you know, thought up a, a way that they could spend five hours a week trying to make a difference or do a book club or whatever to try and persuade people. You know, if we made just an earnest effort to try and reach out and 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 improve other people's lives and serve them and educate them, you know, we could really make a difference. We we need less, you know, releasing all these energy. I think we need to harness the energy and and uh, put it to good use. So just a thought. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. You know, very good. Very well said. Um, so thank you for the interview, um, Connor. This is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and the Conscious Resistance Network. Uh, wishing all of you have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye.